very excited to, to do this talk. Um, uh, one thing that's different about some of uh, me and the folks in Tokyo is it's 9 p.m. for me, but we have one thing in common, which is that we're drinking coffee probably. So um, trying to combat the uh, 9 p.m. You know, sleepies. But today we're going to be talking about uh, building for data reliability with a set of tools, uh, Data Hub, Great Expectations, and Airflow. Uh, we've got a lot to cover, so let's get right into it. Before we continue, uh, we'll just do a little bit about us. Uh, my name is John. I'm the co-founder of Acryl Data. Uh, prior to co-founding Acryl, I worked at LinkedIn. And I worked kind of on both sides of the data platform engineering and data uh, producer and consumer coin. On the anti-abuse team, I worked on uh, consuming large data sets to look for anomalous patterns like scraping and fake accounts and bot, bot activity. And on another team, I worked to create a unified uh, view of our core data sets across offline, online, and nearline uh, execution environments. Uh, Tomas? Yeah, I'm Tomasz. I'm as well working for Acryl. Previously, I was uh, the tech lead manager of Prezi's uh, data engineering team. So my background is more like data engineering. Awesome. And a little bit about our employer, Acryl Data. Um, we're a company that was founded in early 2021 by data engineers from LinkedIn and Airbnb. Uh, our goal is really to bring clarity and control to complex data ecosystems, the modern data stack, so to speak, by driving forward the open source data hub project, which we'll talk more about in just a moment. And our team consists of 14 full-time employees, three interns, and definitely more than a few pups. Uh, we have representation from a bunch of great companies like LinkedIn, Airbnb, and, and Google. You can learn more about Acryl at acryldata.io. So today we're gonna to talk about a few different things starting with what is Data Hub. <clears throat> then we're gonna continue onto what is data reliability and why you should care. Finally, we're gonna talk about building for data reliability proactively using tools like Airflow, Great Expectations, and Data Hub. So first of all, what is Data Hub? Well, Data Hub is an open source metadata platform which enables data discovery, data observability, and federated governance on top of an enterprise metadata graph. I know that's a lot. Um, so what does that actually mean? Well, what it means is that we kind of try to create a graph or a representation of the people and data and relationships between them in an organization and then build different vertical use cases on top of that graph. So for example, data governance use cases, data discovery use cases, and observability use cases. I think what makes Data Hub kind of unique is that we uh, start with the graph and making sure that we have a high fidelity representation of reality in the metadata graph and then build those use cases on top. Okay, so really what is Data Hub? I, I, that was probably a little confusing to some folks. Um, well, you know, on top of that graph, we build a UI and a set of capabilities. So for example, we allow you to search across your entire data ecosystem um, from all the way from kind of online transactional stores all the way down to your BI tools. In this case, we're gonna be searching for a snowflake table. We allow you to add enriching information like column descriptions, data set descriptions, um, maybe even status of the data set, for example, if it's deprecated or not, so the consumers know what to expect. We also allow you to add things like um, governance metadata. So for example, tags or classifications, which we call glossary terms. And maybe something maybe a little more interesting is we allow you to explore kind of the upstream and downstream dependencies of your data. So here we're actually showing a feature called impact analysis where you can explore multiple kind of graph hops away from this this center uh, snowflake table to understand who would be impacted by a change to your table. Of course, we have the, the graph visualizer as well. For all of the Airflow folks, um, we capture information about your DAGs and the operators that are within them. We even surface some run information, like whether a particular task has succeeded or failed. Um, finally, we collect a set of sort of operational signals about your data such as tests that may have been run on your data and statistics. So 
for example, profiles of your, of your data sets. Uh, we like to think of Data Hub as the number one open source metadata platform. We've got about 40 integrations with different tools, uh, both modern data stack and some, some older tools, of course. And then we have a, a great list of, of adopters like Udemy, Peloton, Zynga, Expedia, uh, and many more that we couldn't, we couldn't show here, unfortunately. Most importantly, I think Data Hub is a community of about 3,200 data professionals. Uh, with representation from mostly data engineers, software engineers, uh, system architects, and the people that are supporting those rules, um, engineering managers, product managers, data scientists, and more. We have representation across a wide variety of countries, I think 56 or, or 60 uh, today, and a lot of different industries, of course. In the past year, we've seen a lot of growth of the community, about 10 times year over year growth in the number of people in the community. And, quite a bit of growth on the commit and contribution graph as well on the right side. So before continuing, I just wanna call out what I think uh, kind of makes Data Hub unique as a platform. Um, I touched on the, the graph uh, aspect earlier, but there's also a set of principles, which we refer to internally as meta ops principles. The first is what we call Metadata 360. It's really about bridging this gap between technical and logical metadata to create a 360 profile or view of the data assets inside of your ecosystem. The second is what we call shift left. This is basically a concept that includes declaring and collecting metadata as close to the action as possible. So for example, declaring column descriptions and tags in Snowflake and collecting them in real time to the extent that's possible. So basically getting deep into the operational plane to source metadata in real time. And the final one is what we call active metadata. And this is kind of the opposite side of the coin, which is about uh, putting metadata that we've collected and indexed in our platform back to work in the operational plane. And that's exactly what we're going to talk about today. OK, with that out of the way, we will talk about data reliability, which is more likely why you guys are here. Um, and when I was thinking about data reliability and what it meant, I started to kind of look at a couple of definitions, uh, the first being reliable. And the Oxford Dictionary defines reliable as consistently good in quality or performance, uh, able to be trusted. Another definition I found useful was reliability, which is really the overall consistency of a measure. And when I started to apply these to um, you know, data reliability, I thought it was useful to describe data reliability as kind of the overall consistency of data quality. All right, well, that's not very helpful. What is, what is data quality? Well, uh, we think of data quality as a set of dimensions that kind of define uh, the characteristics of a particular piece of data. And the most important kind of working upwards, I would say first is availability. So just having data available for consumption, available for use, for different use cases inside of your organization. This is typically the first thing that's solved on a uh, big data journey. The second is what we would call timeliness or completeness. And really what this means is it's a question of how soon after something changes in reality is the data representing that change available for consumption. So the closer to real time you can be, obviously, uh, the better the timeliness or the completeness. So kind of a spectrum. And then the third thing we think about is really the correctness, which is about does the data that you've collected accurately reflect uh, reality, right? Does it actually model what it was intended to model with a high degree of fidelity? On the other side, we think of data reliability as, again, this stability of these characteristics uh, through time. And so what we see on the right side is a picture of something that would be considered less reliable where you have quality on the y-axis and, and time on the x-axis, and you can see it's kind of varying dramatically over time. And of course, something that's more reliable would be uh, defined by two characteristics, actually, which is that the quality is high, but it's high in a sustained manner over time. It's consistently high. OK, now, now that we have those definitions out of the way, we can start think of thinking about how to realize uh, data reliability. And, and really how we think about this is kind of achieving those pillars um, of data quality, but again, achieving them over time as a data ecosystem evolves and changes 
as the scale of data changes, as the tools change in the ecosystem, as new uh, flows are added and removed. Um, and then the second key, I think, characteristic uh, is doing this at scale. Right. Um, today, data ecosystems are extremely complicated. So being able to maintain data quality through time across, you know, many, many different pipelines. And before we continue, I'll just take a second to uh, answer the question of why should you even care about data reliability? And I think maybe the strongest reason is that uh, data is fundamentally becoming a product. And when I say that, what I mean is that Data is now becoming part of the core value creation chain of a company. Uh, I think there's primarily two use cases. One is facing human users. So, um, you know, both internal to a company, maybe an executive dashboard using which you make company decisions, or um, part of the product itself that your company is serving up. And the second is really about machines, right, as the second users of data. Um, sharing data across companies is becoming more and more common. And I think what we'll see over time is that just how companies have built very uh, strong online service dependencies between one another, we will continue to see data dependencies between companies uh, be built more and more going forward. And what does this mean? Well, it means that availability, timeliness, and correctness uh, will continue to grow in importance over time. It's, it's not going anywhere. And so as the data engineering team, we have a few challenges uh, that we have to face here on data reliability. The first is really uh, scale of data, scale of pipelines, just the sheer volume that we're dealing with. And I think three trends are really pushing that. First, it's uh, you know, improved collection mechanisms of data. The second is kind of the cost of storing data, which has gotten uh, dramatically lower over the past few years. And then finally, um, by Sorry, one sec. Uh, finally, it is really the digital literacy, um, which which we've seen increase over the past few years, uh, which has driven you know people interacting with digital products towards an all time high. And what we're seeing here is actually you know the world's uh, produced data over time up until uh, 2025. The second, I think, factor which is really closely related, in fact, is really complexity of the tools that are used to process this data. Uh, as the scale and volume of data has grown, like we've seen companies uh, build, uh, you know, data democratization policies inside of the company, which really has led to a variety of different use cases for that data, which has been collected. And what we've seen is kind of an explosion in the tools that have been built to process that data, each kind of occupying a different part of the value uh, creation chain. And both of these things are in fact changing quite quickly. So I think uh, as data engineers, you know, typically we try to solve this with automation, right? And trying to build operational tooling on top of the scale and complexity. But I think in doing so, you know, we kind of create an emergent challenge, which is being able to separate the signal from the noise. Uh, I know personally, I would come in Monday morning sometimes as a platform engineer and see a ton of DAGs like failing in alerting states. And I really wouldn't know where to start oftentimes in terms of ranking some of these things. So I think a challenge going forward for us as data platform engineers is really being able to build tools that can help us to separate the signal from the noise. All right, so now that we have a picture of data reliability, I think we can start to talk about building uh, pipelines proactively for data reliability or with data reliability in mind. Um, and first, we're going to talk about some of the status quo. So some patterns that we've seen emerging in the real world for how to deal with data reliability. And then we'll propose a new approach along with some real world examples. So um, imagine we have you know, a basic DAG, which is just a transform that produces some output table. We'll call it table. And it's pretty standard setup. Uh, we've got a list of, of consumers which are kind of independent of the production of this data that are consuming the table. So for example, we have a derived table on Snowflake that's being generated periodically, maybe every day. We have another table which is serving as an input to a uh, looker chart. And then finally, we have a third DAG which is maybe generating some, some emails based on this, this data set. Uh, and when we think about data reliability, I think 
there's an organic sort of naturally emergent pattern that will come to be if you kind of leave this setup in its current form. And that first pattern uh, I would call consumer side validation. So uh, this is a pattern in which all of the consumers that are consuming a table are performing their own specific checks against that input table prior to, to running uh, their operations. So you know, maybe, for example, this first uh, DAG will verify that the input table exists. Maybe the second DAG will verify that the row count is greater than zero. And maybe the third DAG just won't do any verification at all. And this is what we call contract on read. So what this means is that the consumer, uh, in isolation, is sort of verifying the integrity of the data before it's processing it. And there's a few different downsides to this approach. The first is that there's kind of ad hoc or inconsistent validation of the input table. So you can actually have a situation where some DAGs are doing some validations that are specific to them and, and others just aren't doing anything. Uh, the second thing is that you can have sort of partial validation of the contract of the table. So what I mean by this is that, you know, maybe one consumer only uses one column out of the table. And so it's only going to verify that that column looks healthy before doing something. So you have sort of this partial validation of the contract. It's similar to, you know, API client only using one endpoint out of 10. And, you know, that's it. So the third thing is duplicated efforts, which, you know, is obvious kind of duplicating these types of assertion or quality checks. Uh, across many different fanned out consumers. The second uh, pattern that we see is what I would call async validation. And, and this one, uh, don't get me wrong, is a bit better. Uh, in this pattern, the owner of this transform or this table uh, takes initiative and defines a set of validations against the table using a tool like Great Expectations or DQ or DBT tests um, that run sort of periodically. So for example, maybe we check that the ID column is distinct, the age column is not null, the row count falls within a range, excuse me, and the standard deviation of the height column is, again, in some range. And then generally, we'll have some alerts set up that will notify the author of the validations when, when things go wrong. We call this contract after write, because really what's happening is that once the table is produced, it's being validated on some cadence. Um, and, and there's kind of a big problem with this approach too, which is that bad data can propagate through the pipeline by default, right? So there's nothing stopping uh, that table from flowing into those downstream consumers if something is wrong with it. And so we started to think of whether we could you know, do better in this architecture and what we could do uh, to improve it. And I think one thing that we kept coming back to is this idea of, you know, putting validation on the critical path of the production of the table. So for example, adding validation, great expectations checks, for example, as the final step in a DAG. Um, and there are some patterns that you can use to do this. For example, you can fail the Airflow DAG if the validations don't succeed. Or you can use a, a pattern like the um, stage check swap pattern, which I think initially came from uh, Airbnb, where you stage a data set run some validations against it, and then swap it, uh, the staging data set with the production data set. But, um, and I think, you know, this is good, by the way, and we call this contract on write, where you're actually ver verifying the integrity or the semantic contract, not just the, the schema, but the, the shape of the data when you write it. Um, it has some, some clear benefits like consistency and, and coverage of the actual contract and then centralization, of course. But there's a main problem we find, which is this communication problem. It's really how do the decoupled consumers know that the upstream data set that they're depending on it has been validated or not? Even if the airflow pipeline fails, there's not a great way to kind of communicate that downstream. And so uh, an approach we'd like to propose is one in which you establish a communication channel between the producer and the consumers via a metadata platform. And really what we call this is metadata-driven orchestration. And here's how it works. So step one, uh, you instrument the upstream producer 
with a final stage, which reports information to a central platform. And then you add a set of boilerplate um, simple logic into each consumer DAG, which will run some pre-flight check. So for example, the, uh, you know, the original producer DAG may say that I've inserted 45 rows into the table. And oh, also by the way, the table has passed the entire validation suite that I've defined for it. And the pre-flight check can ask, is the input data up to date? So was there rows inserted in the past 12 hours, for example? And is it passing its validations? And if that, those conditions are true, we can simply run the pipeline. And if they are not true, we can block the pipelines or circuit break the pipelines. OK, so enough of the high level uh, architectural discussions. Now we're going to take a couple minutes to talk about a real world example um, where we can use tools like Data Hub and primitives that are provided by Data Hub uh, and Great Expectations to start to build pipelines using this architecture from, from the beginning. So uh, let's imagine that we are working for a company that does pet adoptions. And we have you know, this basic pipeline set up, pretty standard. We have a profile for every single pet, which has details like its age, what type of pet it is, uh, among other things. And we have that uh, online database being copied periodically or ETL periodically into our S3 buckets. And then we have a Snowflake loader DAG, which will read that every day and write that into a Snowflake table. And then finally, we have an email sender uh, DAG, which will read from pet profiles, and then it will send uh, emails to prospective adopters about pets that are available for adoption. And we have this pipeline, it's working, uh, but one day we have a problem. And that problem is delayed data. So uh, the ETL job that typically will copy the online DB into S3 is delayed today. And so what that means is that the Snowflake table also doesn't get updated today. However, our marketing airflow job, it, it still runs, right? And so what is the effect of this? Well, we produce bad emails. In fact, we, we send uh, prospective adopters pet profiles for pets that may have already been adopted, which we really don't want to do because we don't want to pull on their heartstrings. Uh, and we also don't want to overwhelm our customer support team. So um, this is where the first abstraction provided by Data Hub comes into play. And this is called Data Hub Operations. Data Hub Operations uh, allows you to report and then verify operations against a data asset. So we'll talk about the first step, which is reporting. Um, so reporting is a matter of adding a small snippet into your Airflow code, which would allow you to push this statement into Data Hub. I've inserted X new rows into the pet profiles table at this time. I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Tomash, and he's going to show you how to actually integrate this reporting step into your uh, Airflow DAGs. Yeah, so let me show you how you can apply this technique in a, a real Airflow DAG. For the simplicity, uh, we will have two DAG, what you could see in the previous slide, which uh, one will be the Snowflake loader and the DAG, and the other will be the email sender DAG. And both will have one simple batch operator, which will represent one will represent the Snowflake loading, and the other will represent the email sending. Uh, so as you can see here, we just created a batch operator and it will be called like the load S3 adoption pet profiles. For this uh, operator, we are setting uh, inlets and outlets. Here we are using a um, data hub entity called dataset, where you can, as you can see, you can set uh, the platform and uh, the dataset itself. So there is an uh, S3 input uh, which uh, and you can see the path there, and there is and it generates a snowflake table, which will be called long tail companion uh, adoption .pet profiles. And the, we want to report operational metadata, and we will do on in the on success callback because we only want to uh, uh, submit operational metadata when we have a successful uh, task run. So. To do this, we are defining this uh, success uh, function, 
which will be the Yokoda's uh, report operation. There we need uh, to set up a data hub uh, connection. And then we are creating an operational reporter. And with the operational reporter, we go through all of the outlets, uh, which is defined for this task. And we are sending uh, one operational metadata for each. Here in this case, as you can see, uh, for the uh, report operation method, you need to specify an earn. Earn is a, a unique identifier of a data set in Data Hub. If you are using the data set entity, we, we just generate for you this earn by calling the earn method. And then you can also specify the type of the operation. In this case, we use insert, but you can use like update or delete. So uh, there are various operations. And you also can specify uh, the partition, what you can see here, but actually you can do that. You can specify the partition, you can, uh, and you can send in additional metadata, like a number of rows affected or any kind of key values you want with your operation metadata. Awesome. So <clears throat> once we've started to report the operation metadata, the second step is verifying um, the operational metadata has been reported for your input data sets. And so the second piece will allow the email sender DAG uh, before running to ask the question, have new rows been inserted in, let's say, the past 12 hours? And as Tamash was mentioning, um, you can of course also do things like report custom metadata. So if you wanted to report the job type that triggered the change, for example, a scheduled versus like a backfill or ad hoc job, you can also report that and verify that on the email sender side as well. And now I'm gonna send it back to Tamash to show you how to add this circuit breaker on the receiver side. Yeah, so for or uh, email sender uh, DAG and actually in, in the, or email sender uh, DAG, we want to make sure it won't start too early. So making sure that we have operational metadata uh, exists for the Snowflake table, what we uh, want to use. For this, we are adding uh, into our DAG a uh, Data Hub Operational Circuit Breaker Sensor, which is a Data Hub uh, Airflow primitive, which uh, we are going to provide. Uh, it's called like a profile operational sensor. There you can list uh, these uh, data hub unique ident uh, data set identifier, these urns. So the list of urns you want to check if it exists. And also you can uh, set a time data which where you can say in what time frame you accept uh, these uh, operational metadata. Because of course you want to make sure your data set uh, was updated and you are not really interested in uh, operations which happened maybe two days ago because you want to make sure your data, uh, the data is fresh, what you are working with. Awesome. I think this is and, also available. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, sorry. So, yeah. So, uh, but here we, we uh, now we're using uh, the sensor uh, for from these circuit breaker, but actually it's also available as an operator or even you can use the direct Python API, which is uh, used under the hood of these uh, uh, sen sensor or operator. Awesome. So then just a quick demo of this feature. Yeah, so here you, you will be able to see a quick demo where we will have these send emails and we start uh, that pipeline and the pipeline uh, should should start, and the sensor should uh, uh, is uh, checking for operational metadata. But because there is no operational metadata, the sensor is just waits until it uh, appears. Uh, yeah. So in the logs, you should be able to see it's uh, the data set is not consumable state. Uh, that's Snowflake table, so it's still waiting. Uh, but if we go to our first tag, which is uh, the Snowflake loader, and we run that, which will produce the operational metadata with the, pre uh, with the uh, uh, success hook, what I showed before. Uh, it seems like we have some, some loading issues. Yeah. Loading issues. So basically, uh, the uh, the snowflake loader 
in the success tool who will produce this operational metadata. And you should see in the logs here that it's sent to Data Hub, the operational metadata. Yeah, I think we'll just have to talk through the rest of the demo here, Tomas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so basically, we just send it, and you should see be able to see in the video. And uh, then, if, if you go back to the sensor, the sensor should pick up, should see uh, the the operational metadata and basically the pipeline uh, uh, proceeds, the emails and the pipeline proceeds. And this way, because we have operational met metadata, we can make sure it's uh, it's using the latest. Uh, so basically, the Snowflake table was updated and it's safe to start the pipeline. OK, cool. All right, yeah, so, so that that kind of helps us in achieving you know, availability, timeliness. It allows us to ask questions about the upstream data and, and when it has last been produced. Um, so our, our pipeline is running a bit better. We haven't had the delayed data causing uh, you know, bad emails to send recently, but a few months later, uh, we have another problem. And in this case, uh, it's related to a change that was made in the online service, um, actually a timestamp column, which was being written previously as seconds, was changed to milliseconds, um, I guess, to align with industry standards. And what happens is that that data, of course, again, makes it to, makes it to Snowflake. And we happen to be filtering for pet profiles that were recently updated. And of course, we were filtering uh, based on the expectations that the, that column would be in seconds. And so what happens here? Well, um, we failed to send any emails uh, on this day because we had this data change. And this is where the second primitive um, that Data Hub provides comes into play. And we call this Data Hub assertions. Uh, which consists of kind of, again, two steps. So the first is reporting assertions in GitHub when you produce some data. And the second step is verifying that the assertions have indeed run and run successfully uh, prior to running downstream DAGs. So for example, in, in this example, we may have instrumented our Snowflake loader uh, pipeline with a great expectations suite. And this allows us to write semantic checks against the data. For example, that the ID column is distinct or the age column is not null, the, the row count is in a certain range, and, and of course, the, the timestamp column is indeed in, in milliseconds. Um, and so now, Tomash will talk about how to actually start reporting uh, these assertions. Yeah, so the, to degenerate, uh, so basically to run in, uh, defining data quality checks, we are going to use a great expectation, the open source data quality tool, uh, which has native integration with Data Hub, which means uh, it, it can send in uh, assertions into Data Hub with a simple config. Uh, so first we define assertions, and then we, we, we are going to define uh, a simple uh, bash operator, which will run these uh, great expectation uh, tests. Uh, as you can see on the top right corner, uh, basically we're just running from the command line, the great, a great expectation test run. And then because it's already set up to send uh, send it to Data Hub, you can see on the actual data set page uh, the, the assertion results. So again, uh, second step is very similar to the previous example. Um, now we can instrument that downstream consumer to ask this question. Are all the assertions passing? Uh, and are there results in the past 12 hours? Yeah, so we also providing a, a, a primitive for uh, data of assertion circuit breaker. In this example, I'm going to now using an operator, but as we mentioned earlier, there is a way to use sensor or even use the, pure, the, the Python API as well. So for, first we set up a data assertion circuit breaker operator. And then the, the similar like, way like before, you need to specify a list of uh, urns or uh, these unique uh, data set identifiers. And we have an additional property, which is the verify after last update, which actually using the, uh, the, the operation 
metadata which we had like in the previous step uh, because first it checks the when the last operation happened and then it makes sure it only accepts assertions after the last operations because one thing about what we don't want using you know old uh, data quality check results because uh, uh, that most prob probably outdated so we always want to make sure if some update or insertion or anything happened with the data set we always use uh, assertions which happened after that operation. Awesome, and I think we're running a little bit short on time, so I'm gonna skip the demo um, here. But you can imagine uh, the demo is basically pushing assertions, uh, if they're failing, circuit breaking, if they're succeeding, uh, running the DAG. So uh, after we've put, put this kind of mechanism in place, we're now pushing semantic checks uh, to Data Hub, and then we're validating that they exist before running our downstream a consumer, uh, you know, we think we're in a great place, uh, but indeed a few weeks later, yet another problem arises. And in this case, it was a, a real bug. So uh, the online code that creates pet profiles, it was updated and now it's producing age columns uh, set to zero for all new profiles, meaning that this indicates that the age of every new pet is zero. And of course, uh, our validations don't catch this because the age column being zero is actually a valid value. Um, so what happens is you know, the pet profiles data gets this bad data with the new profiles. And of course, uh, we have a, another filter in our marketing airflow job, which filters for uh, pets that are greater than the age of one because uh, you know puppy, puppies kind of, uh, they sell themselves. So we don't really need to uh, send them out to prospective adopters. And again, there's no email sending. So we're back in a bad state. <clears throat> and so this is exactly the scenario which uh, I think this third abstraction from Data Hub can help with um, because tests really just can't catch everything. You can't know in advance what the data will exactly look like. And that is Data Hub incidents. Uh, data Hub incidents allow you to manually raise an incident on a data asset um, uh, using both an API and, and the UI. So this can be used for things where we know the data is bad for some reason. It can also be used for things like data backfill, where you want to actually section off a data set for undergoing maintenance. And then you want to do something like circuit break based on the incident. So you can see here the process of uh, defining or raising an incident on a, an existing snowflake table on the left, and then uh, seeing the active incidents for that table on the right and, and being able to publish that to the internal uh, company. So step two, after you know, raising an incident is very similar. Again, uh, it's instrumenting the downstream pipeline to ask yet another question before it runs. And that question is, are there any active incidents on my input table? Is anything actively wrong that I should be worried about? Tomas? Yeah, so I, I speed up a bit as well. So here uh, we are going to set up an incident circuit breaker because we have a circuit breaker for this as well, uh, which will be run in a pre-execution hook. The setup is quite similar like the previous ones actually. So you need a data connection to set up. You need an incident circuit breaker set up. And then we are getting all the inlets from uh, your task, which defines so all the input data sets. And then we go through and try to check with the circuit breaker if uh, there is any active incident for any of the input data set. And if there is, then it will generate an exception which will stop your pipeline. Awesome. And we have one more demo. Of course, we'll skip this one as well, but you can imagine what it does. And finally, we'll come back to this pyramid of reliability. I think what we've attempted to build is really a set of primitives that can help you sort of work up this data quality pyramid and build uh, resilient pipelines that can you know, produce reliable data over time. One thing we haven't touched on really is this idea of at scale. Uh, what we did is we instrumented an existing pipeline with some different uh, primitives but imagine we have hundreds of DAGs or thousands of data sets or even, even more. 
Um, and so we started thinking about how we could take these same concepts and try to achieve scale uh, with them. And I think we came up with this idea that achieving scale is, is really about you know, centralizing control. And we started thinking about you know, key characteristics as a central data platform team that we would want to be able to um, control or orchestrate uh, you know, thousands of, of DAGs. And I think the first one we came up with is really being able to kind of decouple the rules definition from the enforcement, i.e. The, the circuit breaking itself. The second is, is being able to change the rule set that's evaluated over time. And I'll talk about what I mean exactly in just a moment. Um, the next thing is you know, configurability. So, so being able to you know, target a subset of the most important assets and pipelines uh, with these, these centralized controls. And then finally, usability. So not having to go into every single DAG uh, and add that, that, that circuit breaker manually. And so what we came up with is this vision that we're working on called Data Hub Tests. And really, this is a framework for a central data team to define sort of a high level declarative policy um, inside of Data Hub. Uh, for example, you know, all tier one data sets must have some passing assertions. And then two, uh, automatically instrument all of the pipelines in my ecosystem to actually check against those tests before running. Um, so essentially providing a, a, a tool to, to govern my, my scaled data ecosystem. And so uh, on, the, on the left side here is the actual product uh, that we've come up with in Data Hub for uh, defining tests, so central policy definition. In this case, we're defining a test that's saying that all data sets that are classified as tier one must have some passing assertions. And so you can see below in the define your test section, uh, there's kind of two main parts. The first is really a filter, which says which, which data sets or which assets in my ecosystem does this policy apply to? In this case, any that are tagged with tier one tag. And then second is rules. So what, what are the rules that these data sets must pass? And then what we do is we take that definition and we evaluate those rules on your metadata graph consistently over time so that you always have an up-to-date picture of if an asset is passing or failing those rules. So on, on, the, on the right side here, you can see kind of the, the outcome of those, of those tests appearing on an individual data sets page. For example, the pet profile uh, snowflake table that we were working with earlier. And I think I'm gonna pass it back to Tomas to show you how you can actually easily instrument um, your Airflow ecosystem with this type of, of, of check. Yeah, so uh, I, as we mentioned earlier, we, we don't want the DAG authors, uh, let on the DAG authors to add uh, one by one for each of the task these uh, these uh, circuit breakers test circuit breaker so there is a way how you can do in airflow to apply for to all of the tasks in all of your decks so in, in this example we are going to use a cluster policy uh, which and the and more like a task policy so if you if you don't know what's cluster policy but these policies are applied like cluster wide in your airflow and task policy is basically getting all the task instances uh, in all the DAGs, and then you can mutate those text, uh, task instances. So in this example, what we are going to do, we are adding a pre-execute uh, execution hook uh, uh, for all of the tasks. Uh, and there we have this uh, test policy, and as you can see in the task.preexecute, we are defining this pre-execution method, which is a metadata test pre-execute, which actually is built up the similar way what you could see earlier. Like it just needs a data connection. We, we just create a metadata test circuit breaker. And then we are getting all the inlets and checking if there is any active uh, test. Uh, uh, so if all the tests are passing for those uh, input data sets, and if any of it's failing, then we basically just uh, open the circuit breaker and it will fail the pipeline. So if you uh, apply these uh, cluster policies, basically the, the, the DAG authors don't have to do any change in their uh, pipelines because it gets applied automatically. Awesome. One more demo, we will skip right through. Okay, coming back to this reliability pyramid just one more time. Uh, what we've attempted to walk through is just a set of uh, 
uh, primitives which can help you build reliable data pipelines. And we call this kind of preventative metadata. So putting metadata to work in the operational plane. Uh, data Hub provides a toolkit of abstractions that can help you to make your pipelines more resilient. Uh, data Hub operations, Data Hub assertions, Data Hub incidents, and finally, uh, Data Hub tests, which we demoed at the end there. And before we go, we'll just summarize what we've talked about and uh, what we hope you take away from, from this talk. Um, the first is that you can think of data quality as a series of dimensions, maybe with the most important being availability, timeliness or completeness, and correctness. You can think of reliability as sort of maintaining data quality consistently through time. And what we presented is kind of a new approach to building uh, pipelines for data reliability or with data reliability in mind proactively using metadata-driven orchestration. Uh, finally, we went through uh, a set of tools that can help Airflow users start doing this uh, today. And that is Data Hub operations, Data Hub assertions and incidents, and Data Hub tests. Uh, with that, I will continue on to a few plugs and then we'll take questions. So if you want to try Acral Data Hub, you can sign up here. If you want to join uh, the Data Hub community and join the Meta Ops movement, here are a bunch of links to, to join the community. Uh, if you want to try the open source Data Hub, just simply run these two commands. And finally, if what we talked about today was interesting, if you agreed with anything or disagreed with anything, maybe more importantly, um, definitely reach out to us. Uh, we're thinking about these problems uh, on a daily basis. Right, with that, I will pause for questions.